Right, here's the, the first part of chapter four. Um, oh, it, it's actually called the chapter Organising Animals and Plants. To be honest, what they've done really is talked about transport in animals and transport in plants. Transport meaning um, moving things around from one place to another, I guess. Uh, and for animals, that's basically um, going to be talking either about oxygen um, or dissolved soluble um, substances, um, usually food. Um, you know, is the way to think about it. That's what you've got to do, you've got to get oxygen around dissolved food and of course waste products, things like uh, carbon dioxide and urea. And something worth recalling here or making a point of here, um, when you're talking about transport, get the idea of where it's going. It's going to cells of the body. Don't just say, well oxygen is transported to the body, it's transported to the cells. Carbon dioxide is transported from the cells, ends up at the lungs. Urea, transported from cells, ends up, um, transported from cells in the liver actually, but ends up um, going through the kidneys and, and being uh, excreted as waste and urine. But that's the key to it. Keep talking about it in, in terms of cells. Don't just talk about it as a body. So anyway, uh, in terms of animals, first of all, we'll start with blood. Um, the key to this is there are four components or parts that make up blood, if you like. Uh, the red blood cells, um, this nice sort of disc shape, properly called a biconcave disc. Concave means it's kind of um, squeezed in on both sides. So if you were looking from a side, that's a biconcave shape. Uh, it gives it a nice large surface area. Its role is to bind oxygen to, uh, it's actually a protein called haemoglobin. Okay, that's a useful word, bind. Doesn't sort of attach or attract or absorb, binds. That's that's a, a, probably the best way to put it, okay? Uh, you've got your white blood cells, which are involved in the, I would just say the immune response, because there are lots of actually, actually lots of types of white blood cell, and they do various different things, so I would just be very general with it and say the immune response. Uh, plasma is probably a difficult one to explain, or not to explain, but uh, to describe. Um, plasma is really the part that in the blood that's the transport medium, it's the stuff that everything can move around in. Um, so what I would say here is it transports dissolved substances. And we mentioned some of those dissolved substances at the top. Uh, we mentioned carbon dioxide, for example, urea, and dissolved food. Okay, so any of those would do as a description of plasma. And I'll put it over here so that we've got space. Platelets, which are involved in blood clotting. Okay, preventing blood being lost and also preventing um, pathogens, disease causing organisms getting into your blood. If you get yourself. Uh, blood vessels. I, I've got a bit of a problem with the way this is done. Um, the way it's always done in the books, it talks about blood vessels as arteries, veins and capillaries. Now the reason I have a problem with that is it makes you think of things in the wrong order. So the order should actually be, as far as I'm concerned, this, arteries, capillaries, veins, because that's the direction it goes through um, in your body. Um, typically an artery, has a small hole in the, uh, going through it. That's actually called a lumen. Just means a hole in the middle of a tube, like the hole in the middle of a toilet roll, I suppose is a lumen. So the lumen on an artery is quite small. This bit here um, is, is known as the wall, and that's thick and quite elastic. Elastic means it, it goes back to its shape after it's been stretched. An elastic band, you stretch it, but it returns to shape. So the arteries, they stretch as the blood is forced through under pressure, and they recoil again. That recoiling actually helps push the blood around. Uh, so I'll do capillaries next, I'll follow my own rule. Uh, very, very thin, much thinner, you know, in comparison than, than really than I've drawn it here, it would be kind of the thickness of a, a human hair perhaps. So very, very thin, one cell thick uh, in the, the capillary walls, and they're actually quite leaky. Stuff can leak in and out, or fluid can leak in and out. Plasma, if you like, can leak in and out. Uh, arteries, capillaries, and veins, they tend to be it says, much larger lumen. They're not always rounded like the artery because the blood is under much lower pressure. So they've got larger lumen, um, low pressure blood, as opposed to uh, the arteries. By the way, here, you know, if you, you're wondering about the pressure here, certainly it's high pressure in the arteries. What's the pressure like in the capillaries? Well, it's kind of high and kind of not. 
um, I'd avoid talking too much about the pressure in the capillary because it, it changes basically depending on, on where you are I suppose but certainly know that the pressures the arches and the veins and of course the veins also have valves easy to remember v for vein v for valve and the role of a valve is to prevent uh, blood flowing backwards or what's known as backflow okay uh, the heart i'm not going to go into all the parts of the heart because i think it's something you can quite easily sort of get yourself remembering that the left side is larger um, or it's got a thicker wall thicker muscle on the left side that's the side that's going to um, pump the the blood around your body um, main blood vessel there coming off the aorta this one because it's coming into the heart okay it's pulling blood into there so it must be a vein if it's coming in it's coming for the lungs that's actually a pulmonary vein I'm not going to write these all out um, and on the other side and of course we know that these things aren't really red and blue but we draw them this way to show um, that uh, it's, it's easy to see the, the different blood deoxygenated blood blood alone oxygen as it's coming into the heart is a bit more purplish but it's not it's not blue anyway notice that the two blood vessels at the top blood's going out this one is actually uh, the pulmonary artery uh, and if it's coming into the heart this one must be another vein and this one is actually the um, its name is actually the vein carver got that sort of latin in there but it's a vein again okay and we've got our four chambers in here the the atria at the top the ventricles is a bit of a rubbish drawing but you, you get the you get the idea they're, they're not both open into the, that that kind of I end up drawing a proper heart on it. Uh, it kind of looks more, a bit more like that. But you get the idea. There's the atria at the top, uh, the ventricle pointing down. That would be uh, the left side, left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle. Okay. Um, problems that could go wrong with this, um, or things you can do if there's a, a problem with it. Um, stents. These are the little, um, it's like a little wire mesh meaning it's it's kind of like a little tube uh, made of wire I suppose and you could put that inside of an artery that was um, if you've had a blockage in an artery um, the, 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 what happens is you kind of get a bulge in the wall of the artery it bulges outwards and it squeezes um, the blood these blood uh, red blood cells can't get through as easily and that increases pressure okay so these little meshes called a stent and widen it this is particularly a problem, it can happen in any of the arteries in the body, but it's a particular problem in what we call the coronary arteries. Um, and these are the ones that supply the actual heart with blood. So not these ones on here, they actually supply the heart muscle with blood. If one of those gets blocked, you can get a heart attack. Of course, that's a problem. Um, you also have, sounds a bit similar, but stents and statins. Statins are a drug, they lower cholesterol. Uh, as we get older we tend to have higher blood pressure anyway um, and it's very common now for people perhaps if you've got a, another uh, risk factor for heart disease um, you know age genetics uh, lifestyle factors whatever it may be um, you might be given these uh, risk of side effects as there is with any drug but you know uh, compared to the risk of, of heart attacks um, you can take that into account um, yeah, also there's the, the pacemaker, an artificial pacemaker. Um, this is because your heart has a certain um, natural rhythm of beating. It's about 60 to 70 to 80 beats per minute, depending on your age, how fit you are and so on. Uh, and sometimes that stops working so on your heart, you have the artificial one uh, put in and that will simply tell your heart to beat um, to increase its, its uh, rate of contractions. Um, as you need it. Uh, you can actually get an artificial heart as well. Um, there actually aren't that many heart operations, heart transplants, sorry, done um, every year. Not Nowhere near as many perhaps you might guess. You know, it's in the order of about 100, I think. Um, and a lot of the problem with that is getting um, adequate donors. So if you can make an artificial heart, um, you know, that, that potentially is, is could, could cause... Um, a, could help a lot of people who are waiting for uh, on the donor list 
Um, you can also have artificial valves. Sometimes the valves in the heart, which again, do exactly the same as in the veins, they're preventing the blood going the wrong way. So the valves make sure there's no backflow or it goes the right way. If the valves are leaky or there's gaps, um, you can have an artificial valve put in, or sometimes even a valve from uh, an animal, which is called a xenotransplant, which is quite a nice uh, word. Um, and uh, again, that's another potential thing that you can be done.